Hey, what's up guys? Matt with the Movement System. Today we're going to talk about the stretch shortening cycle. We're going to talk about the physiology behind the stretch shortening cycle, and then we're going to go into training. And at the end of the video, we're going to give you one coaching cue that can immediately improve the vertical jump for an athlete like this. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so to lay the groundwork, the stretch shortening cycle occurs in fast movements such as jumping and sprinting. It involves a pre-stretch of a muscle and then a counter movement where the muscle is actually contracting. So what we know about the phases of muscle contraction, as we're going down, for example, for vertical jump, we're dipping down, the muscles are lengthening, specifically our quads and our glutes, we're lengthening the muscle. So in this case, we're going through an eccentric muscle contraction, we're controlling the motion of lengthening. Then on the way up, we're going through a concentric muscle action. We're shortening the muscle and jumping up. Between those, between the eccentric and then the concentric, there's another phase, and that's called the amortization phase. Now this phase is really important for strength and power and speed. This phase is really where the stretch shortening cycle starts to give us our recoil. During the amortization phase, there is stored energy. So when we lengthened, we stretched the tendon, for example. That stored energy will be, depending on the length of the amortization phase, recoiled back during the concentric phase. It is during that amortization phase that the stretch shortening cycle works in two ways. The first is the neurophysiological component of the stretch shortening cycle. What I mean by that is that as the muscle lengthens, it's going to stretch the muscle spindle fibers. So you can check out my muscle spindles video if you want to learn more about this, but they're intrafusal muscle fibers that sense muscle stretch. And what those fibers do is they send a signal back to the agonist muscle to cause a contraction. So in the case of a vertical jump, what we're doing is we're stretching the muscle spindle fibers within the quadricep as we're eccentrically activating. And then that muscle spindle response is gonna go through the spinal cord and back to the quadricep muscles to cause them to contract even more rapidly on the concentric. The second aspect of the stretch shortening cycle is mechanical. So when we're going through quick movements like jumping and sprinting and we're stretching our tendon and connective tissue, what it's gonna do is it's gonna recoil and give us energy during the concentric portion of the motion. And that's a mechanical feat because it's not really going through the nervous system, it's just the tendon itself stretching and shortening. So now how does this actually apply to training? Well, when we're going through a jump, a vertical jump, we have a couple options. We can do a static vertical jump where we just squat down, hold a squat for three seconds, and then we jump straight up. And if you test an athlete, they might be able to, for example, do 12 inches for a static vertical jump. That 12 inches really corresponds to just the active muscle contribution to jumping. It's not involving the stretch shortening cycle because they held that three second isometric at the bottom before jumping. The more common way to test vertical jump is with a counter movement, meaning throwing the arms down and then throwing the arms up and jumping as high as you can because that's really how sport movements work. With the counter movement, we're not only taking advantage of the active component of the muscle shortening, but we're also adding on that neurophysiological component of that muscle spindle activation, which is gonna aid in that jump height, and the mechanical tension aspect. So all three things combined, the active muscle, the mechanical tension from the tendon, and the muscle spindle activation will allow that athlete, instead of jumping 12 inches, to, for example, jump 20 inches. So depending on the type of movement that you're doing, you can actually double the force from the muscle just from the stored tendon energy and the muscle spindle activation. It's a really significant contribution to speed and power movements. If this has been helpful for you so far, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future videos. Okay, so how do we actually most effectively train the stretch shortening cycle? And this is a good question. We know the faster the counter movement, the more contribution we get from the muscle spindles and the mechanical aspects of the stretch shortening cycle. So our training for the stretch shortening cycle really does need to involve fast movements. One way that's common to do this is with a depth jump. So basically stepping off of a box, falling a certain distance, and then landing with short ground contact time and immediately jumping. Let's think about the muscle actions involved here. As we're stepping off and falling, we're getting some 
momentum going down to the ground. We're going to hit the ground and then quickly have to transfer our momentum from going down to going up. That's going to be a big change in momentum and that's going to involve a large eccentric stretch on the muscle and a, then a quick rapid concentric contraction to jump after that. If this is programmed effectively, this can be a really effective way to train in the stretch shortening cycle. The key to programming depth jumps right though is that we need a short enough ground contact time that we still get a good effect from the muscle spindles and from the mechanical aspects of the tendon. For example, if we have athletes jump from a 50 inch box, what's going to happen is that eccentric is going to be so long and so forceful that the ground contact time is going to be extended. If the ground contact time extends to 0.5 seconds, that's going to be too long to activate the muscle spindles and to effectively transition from stretch to shortening. So to figure out the appropriate depth jump height, for most athletes, 30 to 32 inches seems to be about optimal. Going much higher than that, and it's gonna be too much force for the athlete to absorb in a short amount of time. Going too low, and you're not gonna get enough of a stretch to get an effective shortening response. And another reason that that 0.3 seconds of ground contact time starts to be less effective is that we can actually start to touch into the Golgi tendon organ activation, which is counterproductive for activating the stretch shortening cycle. If we think back to our rate of force development curve and we're hitting that max muscle activation, what we're actually doing is putting peak tension on the tendon and that could actually activate our Golgi tendon organs and that would cause a decreased activation of the agonist muscle. So most of our training for the stretch shortening cycle is gonna occur at the early portion of the rate of force development curve in that 0 0.1, 0 0.15 type second range where it's really peak rate of force development and not maximal force. Okay, so let's say you apply all these principles and you effectively train your athletes to improve their stretch shortening cycle. What else is gonna improve in their muscles? A common misconception is that the athletes will get more elasticity in their tendons or that their tendons will become more bouncy. And you'll see people saying this a lot, but really the muscle is actually getting stiffer. So the response from the musculotendinous unit is actually increased stiffness. And that increased stiffness makes you absorb force quicker, which would allow you to express force quicker when we think about that stretch shortening cycle. What this will result in is improved reactive strength index, RSI. Reactive strength index is calculated by jump height divided by ground contact time. So if we are training our athletes with depth jumps and vertical jumps and plyometrics and they're effectively improving their muscle stiffness and their muscle spindle response, what's going to happen is those athletes are going to be doing higher jumps with shorter ground contact times. Their reactive strength index will improve. Not only that, but you can actually look at the stretch tolerance profile of the athletes and they'll be able to handle more and more forceful eccentric motions. So if at the start of the season they were only doing depth jumps from 24 inches and they improve their reactive strength index there, they can actually go up to say 30 inches or 34 inches, which will then allow them to do greater forceful movements in their sport. Okay, so how can you use your new knowledge of the physiology of the stretch shortening cycle to immediately improve your athlete's vertical jump height or your own vertical jump height? So as you'll see in this video, Katie, our fearless editor and my fiance, is doing a vertical jump here and she's throwing her arms down and then jumping up. But as you can see, that movement of the arms coming down is actually fairly slow. She hasn't been coached on how to perform the vertical jump, but if you are her strength coach, what you could do is you could cue her to throw her arms down faster. What that's going to do is that's going to make the eccentric component faster, which is going to allow for greater activation of the stretch shortening cycle in the amortization phase, and then she'll probably be able to get one or two sticks higher. So your cue as a strength coach might be to throw her arms down faster and then to quickly transition to that upward motion. All right, guys, I hope you learned a lot from the video. If you want to learn even more, make sure you go ahead and join the Strength and Conditioning Study Group on Facebook. And if you're studying for the CSCS, you'll want to check out my Strength and Conditioning Study Course. It includes 24 in-depth videos covering aspects of strength and conditioning, all the way from endocrine to bioenergetics to exercise technique, programming for resistance training, and much more. It's entirely done online at your own pace. So once you sign up, you'll get full access to all the videos, all the quizzes, all the bonus material, and be able to work through it at your own pace. If you're a visual learner and you learn well from videos like this, explaining concepts like this to you, you can go ahead and click the link in the description below to learn more about the Strength and Conditioning Study Course. 
Also, as a small YouTube channel, it's really helpful if you hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that way you don't miss a new video when it comes out. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.